Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, the show that is part of the Simply Luxurious Life online destination, cultivating true contentment, the art of living a life of quality over quantity. Visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, at our simplified URL, tsll.co, or thesimplyluxuriouslife.com to find the show notes for each podcast episode, as well as much more weekly content to elevate your everyday and deepen your contentment. From a Monday motivational post, recipes, videos of the cooking show series, style and decor inspiration, French and British inspired content, and reader's favorite regular weekly post, This and That, which is posted each Friday morning. Now to today's episode. Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 323rd episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Today we're going to talk about savoring. And we're going to look at it through the lens of very specific examples. We're also going to talk about why it's important to know this skill. And yes, this this is a skill. Initially it might sound like an indulgence or a luxury even to be able to savor. And to that point it actually is understandable why people might think that. But as I go through the conversation today, hopefully you'll find that there is a real gift we give ourselves and others as we model how knowing how to savor actually allows us to be able to savor more. And I'll explain what that means as we get into the conversation. Now, at the end of today's episode, I have officially two petite plaisirs for you, but unofficially three, because there's a third one I couldn't help but share with the listening audience. It was already shared on the blog recently, but it is definitely a petite plaisir, and I didn't want you to miss it. I'm also going to talk a little bit about my book that is coming out on March 22nd and will be available for pre-ordering for hardback and paperback on March 1st, so in fewer than eight days. Anyway, I'll be talking you through what that is and how to go about it and what the book's about at the end of today's episode. But first, let's talk about savoring. The art of savoring. Six everyday moments to savor. Part de. The clock neared midnight. The candles on the table still flickered, just at a slightly lower height than when they were lit only six hours ago. The kitchen was full of dishes, waiting to be washed, and the platters of food offered crumbs and hints at the menu that had just recently been shared and enjoyed amongst friends. If you read this past week's This and That and the previous week's This and That, you know that the first dinner party at Le Papillon, my house, took place over this past weekend. And after being thoughtful about when it was a good time to finally be able to invite friends in a large gathering into my home, honoring each person's comfort level and ensuring safety and health precautions as they were clearly communicated so that all could relax and enjoy the evening. So just to let you know, all my friends were boosted and we let each other know we were boosted. I had tests available rapid tests available for for anyone to ease their mind and to ease the rest of the party's mind. I set the date and the menu began being planned as to how to inaugurate Le Papillon as this would be the first dinner party it had ever held. I couldn't wait. My friends said yes. Each showed up with an enthusiasm and welcoming spirit that warmed my heart and I know all the other guests as well. 
and reminded me of so much that I missed during these past two years. As each course was served, each glass poured, sipped, held up to toast, the volume of the playlist was turned up ever so slightly as the evening progressed. And the ease of stepping back into the conviviality of seeing each other, talking intimately, laughing heartedly, and listening closely felt second nature despite the delay of enjoying such a setting. As goodbyes were exchanged, fresh from the oven cookies were given to each guest to enjoy on the car ride home. I closed the door, turning around to look at my home and the visual reminder of all that had just been shared and enjoyed. I sighed deeply and my smile grew widely. Gratitude washed over me, and I knew I wouldn't be going to bed soon, not because there were dishes to be cleaned, but because I was energized in a way only such occasions can lift my spirits naturally, and so I reminded myself to savor. In episode 213 in 2018, if you are a long-time listener of this show, you will remember that I detailed in nine steps and ideas how to savor any given moment in which you find yourself wanting to remain in that present moment, taking all that you are experiencing in fully so as to hold it in your memory, but as well to let it be what it is and not force it to be what you want it to be. Today, I would like to further the conversation on savoring and share with you six everyday moments to savor or moments in which you may forget to savor well, giving yourself permission to take it all in, slow down, and revel in the awesome gifts received by that moment that you are delighting in, that maybe you've waited a long time for, that maybe you just, ah, it brings so much joy when it happens. Studies have taught us that there are three different ways to savor life moments. And when we do consciously welcome the art of savoring into our lives, we actually improve our well-being. Yeah, we, we improve our health, our body, our, 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 our physicality actually improves. And what I mean by physicality is our stress levels reduce naturally because we learn how to better travel through our day. So while it may seem indulgent, even selfish, and at the very least unnecessary to engage in savoring, the truth is to know how to savor and incorporate doing so into your everyday life is to increase the quality of your life. Now let's talk about the study that I mentioned, one of the studies. There are multiple ones, but this one I feel does a good job of breaking down the three different ways of savoring. As detailed through extensive research by Dr. Jordi Quabac of the Barcelona Graduate School of Economics, and I've linked that in the show notes if you want to take a look at it in more detail, the three types of savoring depend upon when and what you are savoring as it relates to time. So the first way you can savor is what they call anticipatory savoring. And that is just as it sounds, looking forward toward an event that will be occurring in your future. So this is the act of savoring in the sense of, you know, you're traveling to a certain destination or, you know, a particular event is going to happen that you're going to be attending and you're preparing yourself. You are reading books, as I mentioned, you're, you're planning your wardrobe, you're watching films on this topic, you're preparing necessary information, anything that might enhance your experience. So when the actual event arrives, you can really drink it up. So that's the first type of savoring. There's actually science behind the fact that this deepens our well-being to let ourselves do that. Experiential savoring is just, again, as it sounds, you're holding yourself in that present moment when that event is actually happening. You're wholly holding yourself present. You're using your senses to appreciate all that is taking place around you, and you're not letting your mind wander ahead into the schedule of what needs to be done or what you're going to do tomorrow, and you're not dilly-dallying back into the past, You're not pulling yourself away in any direction from the present moment. And the third type of savoring is where our focus is really going to rest today. It's called reminiscent savoring. It's to consciously savor an event, a moment, or an experience that while you know it will have an end, you hold space 
for the feelings that were created by that event in your memory. You don't hold on. You're open. Your hands are open. You're, you're letting it be what it is. But because you know it has to come to an end, there's a term that was referenced in this research that's called peak theory. And so when you know it's going to come to an end, you consciously plan a, a positive activity to experience at the end of that moment. So at the end of the trip, on end of the occasion, that moment that you've long anticipated you're enjoying that it's arrived, but you also know it's not going to last forever. So you plan something to conclude it, to put a beautiful ending punctuation mark on it. And it ends it in a grand positive note so that you savor the experience all the more in your memories in reminiscent savoring. Now, much of what we will be talking about in the list today are moments where we have long anticipated their occurrence to happen, and we've hoped that they will go well. And upon such an event going well, we consciously choose to create a space for a peak theory moment as a way to fully savor what has just concluded and deepen the much appreciated event even more. So let me walk you through how that might look in the experience that I began today's episode with, this dinner party that I had this past weekend. Following my first dinner party held in far too long, I think the last one I had, well, not think, I know, the last one I had was summer of 2019 with nine people, including myself, all wrapped around my table, really close and cozy. And I I longed to have that again. Um, And that was in my rental where I used to live prior to finding my home here. Um, And so for me, the opportunity to create a peak experience looks like this. And everyone's will be different. And this is why it has to be done consciously. You can plan it ahead or just let yourself feel your way through it, which is kind of, I kind of do a combination of both of these. For me, when any of these moments that I'm going to share with you occur, one of which is a dinner party, I give myself permission to just be still. I edit out most, if not all, the plans or consciously choose to not make any new plans that day after the event and give myself at least an hour, a morning or an afternoon or an evening, so part of the day, or if I can, if I'm able to, based on what the event is, obviously, I give myself a full day to just let the good memories wash over me one more time. Partly I do this so that I do not forget a moment. I will even sit down and put it all in my journal as I know I will forget those small details that made the evening, the event, or the experience so special. Usually I am home for this carved out time as I was this past weekend. So I will make sure I have a fridge with food for a good meal to be enjoyed. I will snuggle up in my cozy pajamas or leisure clothes, make a pot of tea, probably multiple pots of tea. I will soak in a hot bath at some point during the day, maybe, and most likely I will take a nap at some point. And if, and if I am not home, but perhaps traveling, Um, I will let myself just wander about the city, the town or the countryside I am visiting and give myself permission to then lounge about in the accommodations and drink in the momentary state of appreciation, calm and giddiness I may be feeling. One of the key components and truths of savoring to remember is that savoring is all the more important because it will never be that all is going perfect in our lives. We cannot wait to savor citing the need for there not to be any hiccups or stresses occurring. For example, simply bills that need to be paid, jobs that need tended to, the world still grappling with unrelenting pains. All those things and, and other unique things that you're, you know, you don't necessarily want to have, you know, be going on in your life will be happening. But it's still and probably more important for us to make room for savoring. In fact, it is precisely because there will always be some kind of unwanted thing happening in our most intimate lives as well as the grander world that we must incorporate savoring into our lives. When we teach ourselves that savoring is not indulgent but instead necessary, when we acknowledge that such awesome moments as the ones we're going to talk about today, but there are undoubtedly many more, do not happen every day, we are living in the present, we are living consciously, and we are elevating 
the quality of our lives. We are appreciating being alive. We being human and our stress levels actually gradually begin to decrease. We become better able to navigate through unwanted moments and we find a deeper, steady, resting state of contentment. This is an act of living mindfully. Learning how to savor regularly, exercising that muscle is actually an act of mindfulness. Simply put, savoring life doesn't require perfection. Rather, the art of living a life you love requires savoring. So I'm going to get to this list here in a moment. Six specific examples that I encourage you to practice the art of reminiscent savoring. So that third type of savoring. And I'll give you examples of how I might do that. But again, you're going to do your own thing because you've got to tailor it to you, whatever savoring might be. I have two sponsors I want to introduce you to real quick. So I'll be right back in two minutes. If you are looking for more beautiful hair that's shinier, thicker, fuller, but you also are looking for a 100% vegan and holistic approach, Vegamore is the brand to explore. Vegamore is a transformative, 100% vegan and holistic approach to hair health that leverages smart botanicals clinically proven to promote visibly thicker, fuller, longer looking hair. Vegamore products can become an essential part of your daily care routine. In fact, using these products, I have noticed a positive difference when using their GRO Revitalizing Shampoo and Conditioner Kit, as well as their GRO Plus Serum. All Vegamore products are cruelty-free and 100% vegan and never contain parabens or hormones. And the best of all, Vegamore has a 90-day money-back guarantee. And even better, 91% of customers say they saw visibly thicker hair with Vegamore in just three months' use. So boost your confidence with hair that is longer, fuller, and thicker. Try Vegamore, risk-free for 90 days. Go to vegamore.com slash sophisticate and use promo code sophisticate to save 20% on your first order. That's V-E-G-A-M-O-U-R dot com slash sophisticate, code sophisticate, to save 20% at vegamore.com slash sophisticate. FunJet Vacations is a one-stop shop for all of your vacation needs, including flights, hotels, transfers, and excursions. As experts in the industry, they offer customers a fast, easy, and fun way to book their next vacation to one of hundreds of destinations like the Caribbean, Mexico, Hawaii, Las Vegas, and Florida. They offer exclusive, all-inclusive package deals to Mexico and the Caribbean, and at the heart of every experience and service they offer is fun. They believe that travel is not just a ticket to a destination. It's a gateway to an experience with the people that matter most. They know this can have significant impact on your life, not just when you're on vacation, but by bringing home those lighthearted experiences and filling your day-to-day with a deeper sense of well-being, joy, and downright fun. For a limited time, Simple Sophisticate listeners can use promo code FJ50 for $50 off your next FunJet vacation to Dreams Resorts and Spas by AMR Collection. Get more moments that are fun expected. Surprise yourself with where you could go at funjet.com or call your local travel advisor. Restrictions apply. Welcome back. Let's get to this list of six everyday or moments where we may choose to not savor fully. And um, this is an act of holding ourselves or letting ourselves linger a little bit longer after this much loved event, moment or experience has happened so that that moment is now more imprinted in our memory and therefore it deepens our appreciation. Number one, Let's start where we began. The moments as well as day after a long anticipated event has occurred. So it might be a dinner party or another type of celebration. As I shared, whether you have just hosted a dinner party that went well, perhaps after a big event that required much coordination, a charity gala, a wedding, an anniversary party, a reunion, a birthday party, anything that requires a lot of different coordination, time, organization, and preparation of gathering people together, let yourself savor 
immediately after by doing whatever enables you to just take it all in again, reliving it, thinking about it, letting yourself smile and doodle about doing any task or no task at all that lets it all soak in even more. And I want to just express, we we dwell in negativity as far as worries and fears easily. That's, 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 that's the lizard brain. That, that is the child brain, as Jay Shetty calls it. That comes second nature to so many of us. Our job, if we're going to shift our brains into the monk mind or the sage mind, as Duquash calls it in Calm Clarity, we need to let ourselves dwell in the good. And dwell has a negative connotation. So that's why we're saying savor, savoring the good that's happening in our lives. And when we do that, we are shifting our brains. We're shifting, we're we're putting our brain into a new track. And once we get that into a muscle memory, then we feel more naturally to default to that track of, of savoring things when they go well. So I would suggest doing it right after the event. So last night, as soon as the last guest had left about 11 o'clock, I actually do enjoy cleaning up after the party. My friends helped me during the party throughout, just kind of getting things into the dishwasher. But I still had a lot to do. And one of my friends said, are you going to be okay? I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't understand. That is actually the time where I sit, not sit, I'm standing. I'm savoring, slowly going through the dishes and just remembering the event and doing something very methodical, very robotic, like putting the dishes in the dishwasher is actually a way for me to linger longer in the good memories of that night. And I just go as far as I want to go with the cleanup until I get tired or don't want to do it anymore. And I'll finish up when I want to finish up. But then what I did is while the dishwasher was running and I was waiting for one load to finish, I sat down. I poured myself another cup of tea. I sliced myself a little slice of the dessert. And I just sat and enjoyed it. I wasn't tired yet, and I should have been, but that's what I mean by you're going to know when the moments come into your life that you need to savor, and that was an example of such a moment in my life. Then I would also recommend if it was a really big event, you're probably going to be physically tired, um, and you don't want to run into the next day exhausted because you want to make sure this is a good moment. This is not something where you're going to you're going to say, oh, I can't do those kind of events again because I get so tired and grouchy the next day. This is why it's so imperative to somewhat plan ahead, to somewhat plan ahead of time to give yourself hopefully at least a half a day, but even just an hour um, to either take a nap or to sit, sit quietly and just be um, that next day, whatever you can give yourself is an opportunity to let those awesome memories marinate so that they won't soon be forgotten. So that's our first example of savoring everyday or long anticipated events that you hope go well. And when they do, let yourself savor. Number two, upon seeing, reaching, or holding in your hands the outcome you have longed work so hard for, when any of those moments happen, big or small, work-related or personal goals being reached, once you have reached your mark, holding the published book in your hands, shaking hands with your new boss on that new job you just landed, finishing the home project you planned and saved for, arriving at the airport for the trip you saved up for, once you've reached where you've worked so hard to arrive, create a moment or give yourself hours, whatever time you need to drink in all that you have done to arrive where you wished to be. Let yourself rewind and play back all that you overcame, had to do, got to do, to be where you are so that you never forget and thus appreciate your arrival all the more. That is so important so that you don't rush to the next goal to to, to pursue. Let yourself savor. This will strengthen that appreciation muscle. This is where your your well-being improves. This is where your mind is strengthened. This again is that practice and mindfulness. Number three, seasonal weather long missed. The first rainfall in weeks or months, the long anticipated snowfall, the break in the clouds after days of rain, clear skies after smoky, hazy, or foggy oppression. Just yesterday, so on Sunday, The snow finally came back to bend, 
even if for a few short hours, we had have not seen snowfall in Bend since late December. As the rest of the country has been going through all sorts of snowstorms, it really has felt like spring here. And so I reveled in it. I stayed inside. We had gone for a walk. It just started snowing when we were walking, which was beautiful. It smelled amazing. And I let myself just cozy in when we got home because it was cold outside. And we just, I say we, Norman was sleeping. I just gazed outside and smiled, smiled, and smiled a bit more. Mother Nature will bring what she brings. And each of us, based on our preferences and where we live, have weather we most enjoy. And when that weather has not happened in far too long, when it does arrive, let yourself savor it. Stop whatever you're doing and just drink it in. For me, another example is we don't get a lot of rain here. We have a lot of sunshine days, which are gorgeous and beautiful. And I do enjoy those, um, especially being outside in the garden when they happen. But if it rains here in Bend, I have a little ritual that I do now. I have my Emma Bridgewater um, Union Jack mug. You may have seen it in the Instagram post I posted last Friday. I pour myself a cup of tea. And I will make sure that if I can, I'll go for a walk with, with Norman. He loves the rain. And we'll go walking. I'll put my wellies on and I'll grab my umbrella. Even if I don't really need my umbrella, I just like having my umbrella. But when we come in afterwards or before we go out, I will have a cup of tea with that mug and snuggle in. And if it's raining for a good long time, I will watch a cozy mystery or some kind of British show that lets me escape to England and the English countryside. So that's a way of savoring, creating a ritual around these moments that you can't plan, you can't predict. And if you have time to do those, again, that deepens your appreciation for them. And it really cements them in your mind so that you're, you're finding beauty in the everyday. And it's kind of a lovely way to give surprises to yourself. So that's number three, seasonal weather that is long missed. Number four, when you've finished a book that has transported you, moved you, taught you something unexpected, or deepened your understanding in a way you had never known before, savor it. Upon finishing the book, reading that last word, that last page, that last chapter, you close it slowly. You look up at nothing in particular, and perhaps you just smile as your thoughts seem to have been renewed and enlivened. And Perhaps you sit with this feeling of great expansion and this is where you let yourself savor the gift that you have just given yourself by reading this book, by making time to do this. You are changed, you are growing, you are living and that is an exciting place to find yourself and to realize about yourself. Now this one, you may not take a full day to savor this moment, but maybe you will because maybe this book really changed you or really deepened your awareness of something and you need to go back and annotate or make lists. I mean, for example, a lot of the books that I've brought to this podcast, it takes me a couple days to really just dive into it and break it down. And, and in a way, that is me savoring it. So your act of savoring can take actions. It can involve actions. It doesn't have to be just resting and being still. I lose all track of time when I do that, when I'm savoring a good book. So that's something to think about because I know many of you are readers out there. So that's number four, when you've finished a book that has transported you. Number five, the first daffodil in the garden is seen to be blooming. The first of any perennial, tree blossom or favorite flower that returns since the previous year. So this is for gardeners, but it's also for anyone when you're, so for example, maybe you don't have a garden, but with regards to bringing flowers into your home, the first daffodil that you see at Trader Joe's, before I had a garden, I looked forward to first part of February with Trader Joe's because that was when the first daffodils tended to arrive or tend to arrive at the store. And I would just savor that moment and bring home a, a bouquet's worth and just find a, a pride of place spot in the house and just ooh, revel in it. You know, you don't have to do this with, with, with just gardening um, in the dirt. It can just do with um, blooms of any sort. Whether you sit outside, because you're seeing your daffodils outside, and simply gaze in awe at the beauty that has revealed itself, let yourself delight in this awesomeness of Mother Nature. If the weather is warm, I will sit out on the porch or somewhere nearby the bloom and, and take more than a moment to be in that space with the natural beauty. Sometimes I read a book. Sometimes I will sit outside with a cuppa. Sometimes I will just close my eyes and feel the fresh air kiss my skin. Savor such arrivals in the garden and for Mother Nature because they won't arrive in their first form such as this 
for another 12 months. Savor, savor, savor. So that's number five. And last but not least, stepping foot on the terra firma of a beloved destination, country, town, or home after a long absence. So many of us, and I've heard this from a bunch of readers who are now being able to go visit family or go to certain destinations after two years of of waiting. Their appreciation has been deepened by the opportunity to now go when they couldn't previously. And maybe you don't have plans yet to go where you dream to go. Or maybe, I, I included the last point, maybe you've been away from home for a really long time. I remember as a college student, because I went to college um, seven, eight hours away from home. And I remember the first few times when I came home after a long extended absence, it was just such a sweet return. And my mom made it even sweeter by really making me feel welcomed at home and my dad too. And so part of this might be, you know, savoring this with others that you're traveling with. But regardless, it doesn't have to be with someone else. I know that though the first time that I stepped foot back on France's soil, which I hope will be sooner rather than later, I'm already thinking about, okay, what am I going to do to just drink this up and remind myself how special and how fortunate this opportunity is. So especially if you know you will be traveling soon, or maybe you've just returned from traveling to a place you have longed to visit or returned to after a much delayed absence, think about how you will or can savor how it will feel to be in this place with your own eyes Feel the air of that place, the energy of that place, so that you can hold it with you in your memory when you do have to eventually leave again. Is it visiting a favorite haunt and just sitting and taking in all the goings on around you? Is it taking part in a certain activity that you can only do at this locale? Or maybe it is a favorite drink or food that you enjoy at this, at this particular place or a particular restaurant you've been longing to go back to. I think of when I go back, where will I go get my first croissant? How will I savor it or enjoy it? I'm already thinking about those little things. A one, a one euro croissant. You know, it doesn't have to be so grand and big how you savor. It doesn't even have to cost anything. It might be walking through that favorite garden, sitting by that particular fountain. This is this one I think involves partly the anticipatory savoring. It will also involve the um, experiential savoring so that you can have um, a reminiscent savoring. Whatever it is that you're going to do to savor it, let yourself savor the good fortune to have been able to return. So that's number six. There are many, many more that I hope by listening to this list today have kind of sprung up in your mind of how, oh yeah, I could savor this. I, whenever this event happens in my life, I feel just elevated, like my being, whatever. You just feel good when these moments happen. It just makes you smile without thinking about it. Those are the moments that I'm going to encourage you to remember to savor. Give yourself at least an hour to savor. And if you can, and depending on whatever the event is, a little bit more. Knowing how to savor and why it is important to do so not only strengthens our muscle of mindfulness as it involves the awareness of our mind and where we let it travel and where we hold our thoughts, it also shows us how awesome our one and only life is. When we pay attention to how certain moments that make us feel good in a natural way, we are honoring our most true selves. When we honor our true selves, the quality of our days improves and thus the quality of our lives. Again, to return to a thought expressed at the beginning of this episode, we really are retraining our minds. This is how we do it. And it becomes easy to do it with regards to savoring because we enjoy these moments. We're not forcing ourselves to, you know, refrain from doing something we don't want to do. We're actually encouraging our minds to do something it naturally wants to do. The powerful truth of savoring is that it reminds us that whether the good moments in our lives are large or small, seemingly significant to the outside world or not seen at all, we become more in tune and aware as to how truly rich our lives are and what we think we lack is actually far less than previously thought. 
In fact, we may have all that we need if we would only give ourselves permission to savor more regularly. The exciting truth is, everyday moments abound for us to savor if only we would have the courage to lose our inhibitions and revel in them and then hold them close to us so that we never forget how great life truly is. Let yourself savor. You naturally want to. Let yourself savor. I hope you've enjoyed today's conversation. You can check out the show notes at the Simply Luxurious Life.com slash podcast 323. And I'll be back with three petit plaisirs, as well as more information about the Simply Luxurious Life's new book, The Road to Le Papillon Daily Meditations on True Contentment, coming out March 22nd. <music> Bomba's mission is simple. Make the most comfortable clothes ever and match every item sold with an equal item donated. So when you buy Bomba's, you are also giving to someone in need. Bomba's designed their socks, shirts, and underwear to be the clothes you can't wait to put on every day. Everything they make is soft, seamless, tagless, and has a luxurious, cozy feel. They're made with super soft materials like merino wool, pima cotton, and even cashmere, which makes them the perfect cozy winter layers. There's a pair of Bomba socks for everything you do. They come in tons of options like comfy performance styles for every sport and activity that keeps you moving. And Bombas is something that I wear every day when I'm just taking my everyday walks with Norman, walking around the house, want my feet to stay a little bit warmer. As a simple sophisticate listener, go to bombas.com slash sophisticate and get 20% off any purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash sophisticate for 20% off. Bombas.com slash sophisticate. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does, and therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. I personally can say that I have benefited from seeing a counselor. She has enabled me to do just that, honor my true self, figure out what direction I want to go in my life, and then help me build the skills necessary to live the life I want to live, to engage with the world the way I want to engage. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. As a simple, sophisticated listener, and this show being sponsored by BetterHelp, you, the listener, will receive 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash simple. That's BetterHelp, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash simple for 10% off your first month. So... My first petit plaisir is the unofficial one. And it's unofficial because it's already been posted on the blog, but because I was talking about my dinner party, I wanted to share with you a component that I think you'll find delicious, simple, and a little bit of a luxury. It is the Oregon chocolate chip cookie recipe. And that's the reason I call it the Oregon chocolate chip recipe is because it includes candied hazelnuts. And if you know Oregon and our food sources that come directly from Oregon or grown in Oregon, you know that Oregon is the only place in the United States that grows hazelnuts, often and sometimes called filberts. They're the same thing. Hazelnuts, filberts. Love saying filberts, though. It's kind of fun, right? (laughs) And there is another place, but it's not in the United States, that's in Turkey. So yes, Oregon is known as hazelnut country, and so thus the Oregon chocolate chip cookie. Now, chocolate chip cookies, there are millions of recipes for these, and I ate so many of these cookies growing up, and far too many in my early adult years, but I did stop eating, or even making cookies for the last 10, 
maybe more than 10 years in my house. And the reason is that it's hard to say no after just one. And especially if you are the one making the, the dough, you can have as many as you want. Um, so I've refrained from making cookies. And so what I'll do, I'll either buy just one nice, awesome cookie as a treat, or I will make a batch like I will of this recipe I'm going to share with you and freeze them. And I mean, freeze them like you can't not in not in a, a, a you know big roll individually put them in balls and they will be rock hard and it would just take too much time to hustle in there and, and nibble on the dough. And that seems to work for me. But what are these cookies and how and what makes them special? So first of all, it was inspired um, after visiting a restaurant in Portland, Oregon, a James Beard nominated restaurant in Port- Portland, Oregon, a French restaurant, Coquine. And I went there for a meal once. I've been there for breakfast many times. Absolutely loved it. I've, I've linked to the to the restaurant and my my post about it on uh, this Petit Plaisir post. And we had a full meal for dinner. And we even had dessert. And upon paying the check or getting the receipt back from the waiter, they brought to us two small bags of freshly baked chocolate chip cookies. And they were still warm to the touch. And so as we're strolling back to our vacation rental, because again, we're in Portland, it was a summer evening, and we just nibbled on these cookies as we were walking home. And it just, they melted in my mouth, and or the one I was enjoying melted in my mouth, and it just deepens the appreciation of the meal. Um, it's the last memory you have, right? And so I was like, okay, this is a good cookie. What did they do to it? Oh my gosh, there's these candied something or other nuts in it. And Anyway, it's just absolutely decadent. You wouldn't want to have more than one of these. In fact, you might even want to share it. And so I've also had a really good cookie that was similar to that at Papa Hayden's in Portland, Oregon, which is one of my favorite dessert places to go in in Portland. I used to live a block away from this restaurant on Northwest 23rd uh, back in my 20s. And um, I would go there for a special occasion. I would never be able to afford dinner at that point in my life there. So I would always, always just go and pick up a dessert from time to time. For special occasions. And then also when I went to uh, New, New York City quite a while ago, it was when uh, Levan or Levan's um, cookie shop bakery had just opened on the west side, upper west side. And I remember going in there. I think I've talked about these cookies before. You can now buy them in frozen form at Whole Foods, which I do sometimes. They're really good. Anyway, again, one is enough. One is a treat. Um, it's quite large, but not overly large. And it's plump and just full of all sorts of goodness. About two years ago, I started to play with this recipe. And I didn't have a recipe. I just started to put together what I was tasting. And so I started working on it when we were in official lockdown. And then other things started coming up. So I focused on those. And then I picked up the recipe again at, at where I'd left off. And I finally got to the taste that I feel is the closest to what all three of those favorite recipes are to my taste buds. It reminded my taste buds of what that particular bite was. And so this is a batch of cookies that you make them and then you freeze them for an an hour before you even bake them. So even if you want to enjoy them, if you really want them to be what they could be, you don't want to put them in the oven right after making the dough. You want to freeze them in the balls form. And these balls are pretty big. They're going to be about an inch and a half, two inches um, in diameter um, when you flatten them. And then before you freeze them, you put flaky sea salt on the top. That's really important. And then you bake them for 15 minutes at 375. And it's because they're frozen, as many of you who bake cookies probably know, that gives the butter the chill so that you have crispy edges. But then the middle is nice and warm and gooey and and not entirely baked through in the sense of when it just comes out of the oven. But it's still baked and good and awesome. Anyway, what makes this cookie also very special is that you have candied hazelnuts. And I walk you through how to make the candy hazelnuts. It's so simple. It just takes 15 minutes, then 15 minutes to rest. And then you put them through a food processor to break them up roughly. So easy. Adds a lovely kind of nutty, obviously nutty, duh, Shannon, but sweet, but also savory combination in the middle of the cookie. And you just, that was what really was the magic that took me over the top with the cooking cookie that um, inspired this recipe. So then I, I, 
I, I, I will just freeze all of them in the freezer. And then what I do, what I mentioned at the top of this episode is that's the, that's the parting gift. That's the, thank you for coming. I'm so glad you were here. You know, I give them in uh, parchment bags to my guests as they're leaving. And, um, I just, I'm just so grateful that they wanted to come and I'm so grateful that they did. And I hope they had a good time. And so I, I, I give get one cookie per guest as they leave and they're just a special treat on their own. And you could share them with somebody or you could have it all to yourself, but you really only need one cookie. So I have the recipe um, linked on the show notes and the whole story of where this recipe came from. Again, this is my Oregon chocolate chip cookie, which includes the candied hazelnut. So that's petit plaisir. Um, number one, unofficially. <laughs> um, petit plaisir number two is a French show. It's a French show that um, I've mentioned on this and that before, but for my Francophiles, I think you will really love this show. And my readers brought this to me, so some of you may already know about this. Some of you may have told me about this, and I really got into the series heavily this January, I guess I could say. Um, it's called Murder In, and it's a, so it's a it's a murder mystery. It's very similar in my mind to Midsummer Murders, the English cozy. Uh, mystery um, series and what I love about this there are eight seasons there are about nine to twelve episodes in each season and it doesn't happen in the same town or or countryside in France in every episode they go to a different place throughout France every single episode so it's murder in Alsace murder in Cognac murder in Luberon the Luberon um So you get to see all these different places at different times of year too, seasonality wise in every single episode. And so that also means that the detectives or the prosecutor or the police officer or whoever's solving this particular case is different. Now I will say, if you've watched the series, you know that every episode, while it's a different sleuth that's doing the solving, there's always two main people. If you watch the series long enough, certain cast members will return and their storylines will continue in an unexpected lovely way and sometimes they do change the actual characters names and they become someone different but you do start to become invested in certain characters but they do wrap up every episode with a bit of a love story so that's what's unique about this show is that yes you're solving a murder that's always the the main plot line But somehow there is always a a love story and it's a different than, than what a typical, maybe American love story would be. And what I mean by that is it's not grandiose. It's not too syrupy. It's not necessarily realistic in some regards. Everything happens so quickly. You're like, how is that? But there's always a backstory to the characters. They don't just come in and usually have nothing to do or not know the person that they fall in love with. There's usually a backstory and you get to know that as the murder is, unfolding I I thoroughly enjoy this I've gone through all eight seasons already so therefore I have I am waiting patiently for season nine to appear and you watch this series on MHZ choice which you can then stream if you'd like through Amazon Prime but MHZ choice is um, a foreign language uh, streaming service, a lot of French films, movies and series, but Danish films, Swedish films, um, German films and series are all in this MHC choice. So I highly recommend watching Murder In and uh, sit back for an hour and a half and watch a great predictable, I guess you could say, uh, storyline unfold, which is why we tune in. If you're wondering about the psychology of murder mysteries, cozy murder mysteries, is there's a formula and there's resolution at the end and our minds seek conclusions, endings, satisfaction in that regard. And that is partly why cozy mysteries are such a draw for people to return to again and again. And since they stick to the formula, it's we can trust it. So anyway, that is the second petit plaisir. The third petit plaisir is a book that I thoroughly enjoyed as it arrived last week it is even if you're not a yoga enthusiast I would highly recommend you picking up this book it's called yoga happy by 
London yoga and meditation teacher, Hannah Barrett, simple tools and practices for everyday calm and strength. And it's, there's photos in here, a lot of photos of her. Now she does walk you through yoga, um, poses and whatnot. I actually didn't even look at that part for this book. I have my instructors that I trust and whatnot. And this furthers understanding of different concepts, which I love. And I will return to as that resource. What this book is good at explaining, which she does a brilliant job of doing, is walking you through how yoga connects to mindfulness and how we can use our breath and the power of breath to deepen our mindfulness practice and how mindfulness, to talk about what we talked about today, deepens the quality of living well. She shares science, the science behind it, but she talks about it in a very straightforward, clear way. And she comes at this from a very sincere place. She herself was not always a yoga teacher. She was an actuary in a more corporate environment for years, and she shifted, and her life has improved immensely. I so appreciated her thoughts on self-care and the importance of self-care, she talks about how happiness is a choice. She talks about the different practices um, that are part of yoga with regards to the intentions we set, how we live our every days. Um, in the chapter titled Find Fulfillment and Growth, she talks about the yamas and the niyamas, the ethical principles that are intended to guide how we behave in a compassionate manner toward others as well as toward ourselves and she breaks down what those are so for example yamas would be i'm going to mispronounce these so please bear with me um ahimsa which is nonviolence and thought word and deed satya which is truthfulness asyatya which is non-stealing and that's not just the physical non-stealing but stealing of figurative things as well and she explains what that is whether from others or ourselves and brahmakara, celibacy, or the right use of energy. So where we, and it's not necessarily specifically or literally celibacy in the traditional sense, but this honoring of the energy and using it toward the right priorities and values of our life. And then aparagraha, which is non-possessiveness or non-attachment. She just teaches it in a way that is very approachable. So if you've ever been wondering what is so what is so intriguing about yoga? Why do people practice it? It's not just about the physicality of it. The physicality teaches us how to breathe. The breathing enables us to be more mindful. And it's, an, it's a way to build a foundation for living well in our every days, as she said, toward ourself and with others. It's a beautiful book. Highly recommend it. Even if you never want to do yoga, you do not have to. Read it for the mindfulness and meditation approach. She does walk you through mindfulness practices, um, one of which I practice, which is a very basic one, um, having to make sure that we really breathe deeply and how part of the reason we may not be living as well as we would like has to do really with how we breathe. Speaking of breathing, oh, taking a moment to remember that that is the only thing, she says, that we can do consciously and unconsciously that enables us to live. Okay, three petit plaisirs. I hope you've enjoyed this week's petit plaisirs, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode while I recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. It is good to be back with you in this space. I want to talk briefly about the upcoming release of the third book from The Simply Luxurious Life, one that I am so excited to bring to you. It is called The Road to Le Papillon, Daily Meditations on True Contentment. It contains 496 pages, one entry per the day of the year, so 366 entries, all about how you can live a life of deeper contentment every single day of the year. It is part memoir, a more personal book I have never written. This is a very personal book of my journey over the past 20 years, even really 43, almost 43 years of how I came to know and understand the power of living 
a life of true contentment and what that looks like and what the journey entailed to learn these lessons. But most importantly, it is about how you can live a contented life every single day. So the paperback and hardback will be available for pre-order wherever you order books online. The primary place it will begin being available is Amazon, but you can go to your local independent bookstore. You can, in, in a few days time, it'll be available on other online book sites. Just ask them, give them the title, and they'll be able to find it. Pre-ordering begins March 1st, so a week and a day from today. And then all the books should arrive, hardback and paperback, by March 22nd, if you order on March 1st. The paperbacks are going to come faster. They print easy and quickly. Hardbacks are taking more time to print, so they may take a good three full weeks. So really get that order in if you want the hardbacks. You can take a look at the hardbacks in Friday's Instagram post. I'm really excited of how they look. And the ebook is available for pre-order now. And the audiobook, as you're a podcast listener, that might be of interest. I am in the middle of taping that right now. I'm halfway through. I'm working on chapters six and seven today in the office. And there are 12 chapters that will be available March 22nd, the full audio version of the book through Audible or wherever you get your audio books. And, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited for you to hold this book in your hands. You all have been so patient as I've worked through how to bring this to you over the past two years with the work of illustrator Sarah Locker and my editor and my web design team that put the cover together. Thank you um, for waiting. I do hope it's what you can apply to your everyday life and um, see positive changes. See the, see the life you want to unfold really unfold in a most magical way so again the book is titled the road to the papillon daily meditations on true contentment and with that i'll be back with a new episode on monday march 7th until then stop by the blog i'll have a new motivational post next monday to kick off the new week and all sorts of regular content throughout each week bonjour Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, visit the blog, The Simply Luxurious Life, with the shortened URL, tsll.co. For more in-depth exploration of how to cultivate your own unique, simply luxurious life, be sure to pick up my first two books. Each are available in hardback, paperback, ebook, and at Audible for audio listening. The first is titled Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life and the second Living the Simply Luxurious Life. And look for a third book to be released in the spring of 2022. Readers can now join the more intimate Simply Luxurious Life international community by becoming members of the blog, which provides ad-free, unlimited reading and access to exclusive content, such as each month's A Cup of Moments video chat, tours of my home, Le Papillon, the regular monthly post, What Made Me Smile, and Saturday Ponderings, as well as the opportunity to enter all of the giveaways during French and British weeks. To stay caught up on all things Simply Luxurious, the podcast, blog post, and the cooking show, as well as receive exclusive news and an extra dose of inspiration to jumpstart your new month, subscribe to the Simply Luxurious Life's free monthly newsletter, which arrives on the last day of each month. And there's a weekly newsletter, a favorite of listeners and readers, which is also free and arrives each Friday to keep you caught up on the recent weekly posts on the blog. Enjoy with a hot cup of tea or a cup of morning coffee and stay in the know about all things Simply Luxurious. Thank you for tuning in today and look for two new episodes of this podcast each month on the first and third of Monday. To be alerted to new episodes and when they become available, follow on Instagram, the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, and only the news about this show will be shared. Until next time, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.